Now, let me tell you a few words in the time left to me about the man who, in my view, was really the man who struck the most violent blow at the Enlightenment and began the whole romantic process, the whole process of revolt against a particular world which I've to some extent tried to draw. He's an obscure figure, but obscure figures sometimes create great consequences. Hitler, too, after all, was an obscure man during a certain portion of his life. Johann Georg Hamann was the son of very obscure parents. His father was, I think, a bathkeeper in the city of Königsberg. And he was brought up in East Prussia in a pietist environment. He was a nerd wheel. He wasn't able to get a job. He was, wrote a little poetry, wrote a little criticism. He did it quite well, but not well enough to secure a living. He was supported by his neighbor and friend, Immanuel Kant, who lived in the same city and with whom he quarreled for the rest of his life. And then he was sent by some rich Baltic merchants to London for the purpose of transacting a piece of business which he failed to complete, but instead drank, gambled, and got into heavy debt. As a result of these excesses, he was near suicide and then had a religious experience, read the Old Testament, which his pietist parents and grandparents had sworn by, and suddenly was spiritually transformed realized that the story of the Jews was the story of every man. That when he read the book of Ruth, or when he read the book of Job, or when he read about the tribulations of Abraham, God was directly speaking to his soul and telling him that there were certain spiritual events which had an infinite significance far different from anything which they might appear on the surface, which might appear on the surface. In this transformed religious condition, he came back to Königsberg and began to write. He wrote obscurely under many pseudonyms he wrote in a style which has proved from this day to that unreadable. <laughs> At the same time, he had a very powerful and marked influence upon a number of other writers who in their turn had a considerable influence upon um, European life. He was uh, admired by Herder, who certainly transformed the writing of history and transformed to some degree also um, the whole attitude towards the arts which prevails today. He had an influence on Goethe, who wished to edit his works and who regarded him as one of the most gifted and profound spirits of his time and supported him against all possible rivals. He had an influence on Kierkegaard, who lived after he died, who said he was certainly the profoundest writer he had ever read, not intelligible even to him. <laughs> but nevertheless, although he wrote obscurely, it is possible by dint of extreme attention, which I don't really commend to this particular audience, to collect certain grains of sense from the extraordinary contorted metaphors, euphuistic stylisms, allegories, and other forms of dark poetical speech with which Harman's fragmentary writings, he never finished anything, are written. And the doctrine which he enunciated was approximately this. He began with Hume, and he said, in effect, that Hume was right. That if you ask yourself how it is that you know the universe, you know the universe not by intellect, but by faith. If Hume said that he could not even break an egg, he could not even drink a glass of water, without an act of faith which could not be bolstered up by logic, how much more this was true of almost every other experience we had. And of course, Harman wished to say that his belief in God and in the creation were bolstered by precisely the same argument as Hume's belief in his egg and his glass of water. The French dealt in general propositions general propositions of the sciences. But the general propositions of the sciences never caught the actual living, palpitating reality of life. If you met a man and wished to know what he was like, the idea of clapping upon him various psychological and sociological generalizations gleaned from the works of Montesquieu or of Condillac would teach you nothing. The only way in which you discovered what human beings were like was by speaking to them, by communicating with them. Communication meant an actual meeting of two human beings, and by watching the man's face and by watching the contortions of his body and his gestures, by hearing his words and in many other ways which you could not afterwards analyze, you became convinced a datum was presented to. You knew to whom it was that you were talking. Communication was established. The attempt to analyze this communication into scientific general propositions would of necessity fail. General propositions were baskets of an extremely crude kind. They were concepts and categories which differentiated that which was common to a great many things. Common to many men of different sorts, common to many things of different sorts, common to various ages. What they left out of necessity, because they were general, was that which was unique, that which was particular, that which was the specific property of this particular man or this particular thing. And that alone was of interest to you, according to Harman. 
If you wished to read a book, you were not interested in what this book had in common with many other books. If you looked at the picture, you didn't wish to know what principles had gone to the making of this picture, which had also gone to the making of a thousand other pictures in a thousand other ages by a thousand different painters. You wished to react directly to the specific message, if you like, to the specific reality, which looking at this picture, reading this particular book, speaking to this man, praying to this god, would in fact convey to you. Therefore, he drew from this a kind of Bergsonian conclusion, namely, that there was a flow of life, that the attempt to cut this flow into segments, in some sense, killed it. That the sciences are very well for their own purposes. If you wished to discover about um, how to grow plants, and even then not always correctly, if you wished to know about some kind of general principles, about the general properties of bodies in general, whether physical or chemical, if you wished to know about what climates would assist, what kind of growths to develop in them, and so forth, no doubt the sciences are very well. But this is not what men ultimately sought. If you ask yourself, what were men after? What did men really want? What men wanted was not at all what Voltaire supposed they wanted. Voltaire thought that they wanted happiness. Voltaire thought they wanted contentment. Voltaire thought that they wanted peace. But this was not true. What men wanted was for all their faculties to play in the richest and most violent possible fashion. What men wanted was to create. What men wanted was to make. And if this making led to clashes, if it led to wars, if it led to struggles, then this was part of the human lot. A man who had been put in a Voltairean garden, paired and pruned, as it were, who had been brought up by some wise philosopher in knowledge of physics and the knowledge of chemistry and the knowledge of mathematics and in knowledge of all the sciences which the encyclopedists had recommended, such a man would in fact be a form of death in life. The sciences, if they were applied to human society, would lead to a kind of fearful bureaucratization, he thought. For him, scientists, bureaucrats, persons who made things tidy, every form, smooth Lutheran clergymen, deists, everybody who wanted to put things in boxes, everybody who wished to assimilate one thing to another, who wished to prove, for example, that creation was really the same as obtaining of certain data which nature provides and the rearrangement in certain pleasing patterns. Um, whereas, of course, for Harman, creation was the most ineffable, indescribable, unanalyzable personal act by which a human being in some way laid his stamp upon nature, allowed his will to soar, spoke his word, uttered that which was within him and which would not brook any kind of um, obstacle. And therefore, to him, the whole of the Enlightenment doctrine appeared to kill that which was living in human beings, appeared to substitute for the creative energies of man and for the whole rich world of the senses without which it is impossible for human beings to live, to eat, to drink, to be merry, to meet other people, to indulge in the thousand and one acts without which people wither and die. That the Enlightenment on the whole laid no stress on that. That the human being as painted by Enlightenment thinkers was an artificial a kind of, not economic man, but in any way some kind of toy, some kind of lifeless model, um, which had no relation to the kind of human beings whom Harman met and wished to associate with every day in his life. Uh, Goethe says much the same thing about Mendelssohn. He says Mendelssohn treats beauty as entomologists treat butterflies. He catches the poor animal and he pins it down and as its exquisite colors drop off, there it lies, a lifeless dead corpse under the pin. This is aesthetics. This is a very typical reaction, so to speak, on the part of the youthful romantic Goethe of the 1770s, under the influence of Harman, against the tendency on the part of the French to generalize, to classify, to pin down, to arrange in albums, to try and produce some kind of rational ordering of human experience, leaving out, as it was supposed to be, the élan vital, the flow, the individuality, the create desires to create, the desire even to struggle, the, the, that in human beings which produced between people of different views, perhaps what might be called a creative clash of opinion, instead of that dead harmony and peace, which according to Harman and his followers, the French were after. That, I think, is how Harman began. Let me give you some typical quotations and you will see the kind of thing. The bliss of the human soul, says Harman, is not at all what Voltaire seems to think, namely happiness, the bliss of the human soul is rooted in the untrammeled realization of its powers. As man is made in God's image, so is the body a picture of the soul. This is quite an interesting view. The body is a picture of the soul because when you meet a human being and you say what is he like, you judge by his face, you judge by his body. And the idea that there is a soul and a body which can be uh, dissected, 
that there is spirit and flesh which are different, that the body is one thing, but there is something inside the man, a kind of ghost palpitating inside this machine, which is quite different from, in fact, what the man is in his totality, in his unity, is a typical dissecting French view. What is this reason with its universality, infallibility, overweeningness, certainty, self-evidence, and it is a stuffed dummy which the howling superstition of unreason has endowed with divine attributes. The Abbe Dupont, at the beginning of the 18th century, said, what one has felt and thought in, in, in one language, one can express with equal elegance in any other. This to Harman was absolute madness. Language is that with which we express ourselves. There is no such thing as thought on the one hand and language on the other. Language is not a glove which can be put in our thought. When we think, we think in symbols, we think in words. And therefore all translation is in principle impossible. Those who think, think in particular symbols, and these symbols are the ones which strike upon the senses and imagination of the people to whom we speak. Approximations may be made in other languages. But if you really wish to enter into contact with a human being, if you really wish to understand what they think, what they feel, and what they are, then you must understand every gesture, then you must understand every nuance, you must watch their eyes, you must observe the movement of their lips, you must hear their words, you must understand their handwriting, and then you come to direct acquaintance with the actual sources of life. Anything less than that, the attempt to translate his language into another language, to classify all his various movements by some anatomical or physiognomical means, to try and put him into a box with a lot of other people and produce a learned volume which will, as it were, simply classify him as one of a species, one of a type. That is the way to miss all knowledge. That is the way to kill. That is the way to apply concepts and categories, hollow baskets, to the palpitating, unique, asymmetrical, um, unclassifiable flesh of living human experience. This is, roughly speaking, the doctrine of Harman. And that is the doctrine which he bequeathed to his followers. To abolish caprice and fancy in the arts, he said, is to be like an assassin plotting against the art's life and honor. Passion, that is what art possesses. Passion which cannot be described and cannot be classified. That is what Moses Mendelssohn, that aesthetic Moses, Mo Moses the aesthetic lawgiver, he says, wants to circumcise. He wants to circumcise all these aesthetic commandments. Thou shalt not assail this, thou shalt not taste that. In a free state, he says, where the leaves from the divine book of the divine Shakespeare blow about in all the tempests of time, in a free state, how dare a man do this? Goethe said about him, in order to achieve the impossible, he stretches his hand to all the elements. All that a man undertakes must spring from his united powers. All separation is to be rejected. I must, I think, stop at this point in my next lecture, I propose to go on with the influence of Harman upon the German Romantics and the very violent impact which they thereupon made upon the body of the French Enlightened Establishment. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, last time I spoke to you about the obscure figure of Johann Georg Harman because I believe that he was the first person to declare war upon the Enlightenment in the most open, violent, and complete fashion. Chronologically, he certainly the earliest to have done so. To indicate that he was not entirely alone in this, even in his own lifetime, let me say this. The 18th century, as everybody knows, is the platitude, was, I suppose, the age of the great triumph of science. Certainly, the great victories of science are the most phenomenal event of that particular period. And certainly the profoundest revolution in human sentiment, which had occurred, occurred as a result of the destruction of older forms, both the attack upon the established religion on the part of organized natural science and of the old medieval hierarchy by the new secular state. At the same time, there is no doubt that so far did rationalism go that, as always happens in such cases, the human sentiment, which is in some way blocked by rationalism of this type, sought for some kind of egress in other directions. When the Olympian gods become too tame and too rational and too normal, people naturally enough begin to incline towards darker, more Chthonian deities. This is certainly what happened in the third century BC in Greece and what began happening in the 18th century. There is no doubt that organized religion was in some sense on the retreat. If you consider, for example, the kind of rational religion which was preached by the disciples of Leibniz in Germany, where, for example, the great philosopher Wolf, who dominated German universities, tried to reconcile religion with reason, and anything which couldn't be reconciled with reason became unfashionable 
and that is why it was necessary somehow to save religion by proving its harmony with reason. Wolf tried to do this by saying, for example, that miracles could be reconciled with a rational interpretation of the universe by supposing, for example, that when Joshua stopped the sun at Jericho, he was simply an astrophysicist with profounder knowledge than most other astrophysicists of his time. This degree, this depth of penetration of astrophysical knowledge on his part was certainly miraculous. That when Christ turned um, water into wine, he simply understood chemistry in a manner profounder than that which any human being not assisted by divine inspiration could have understood. Given that this is the depth to which rationalism had fallen, and that religion had to make this kind of compromise in order to get any opportunity of being received at all, it is perhaps not very surprising that people should have turned elsewhere for moral and spiritual satisfaction. There is no doubt that while perhaps happiness and order might be provided by the new scientific philosophy, the irrational desires of men, the whole realm of those unconscious drives of which the 20th century has made us so very acutely aware, began to breed some kind of satisfactions of its own. And so, perhaps somewhat to the surprise of people who um, believe the 18th century to have been a harmonious, symmetrical, infinitely rational, elegant, glassy sort of century, a kind of peaceful mirror of human reason and human beauty not disturbed by anything deeper or darker. To the surprise of people who think that, I think I'm bound to point out that never in the history of Europe had so many irrational persons wandered over the surface of Europe claiming adherence. I mean to say that it is in the 18th century when we begin with the Masonic and the Rosicrucian sects. It is then that all kinds of charlatans and wanderers begin to affect, particularly in the second half of the century, the minds of all kinds of apparently sane and rational persons. It is then that Cagliostro appears in Paris and gets involved in higher circles. It is then that Mesmer begins talking about animal spirits. This is the favored age of all kinds of necromancers and chiromancers and hydromancers who wander over Europe with their various nostrums, engaging the attention and indeed capturing the faith of a great many otherwise apparently sane and rational persons. Certainly the uh, experiments in the occult of the kings of Sweden and of Denmark, of the Duchess of Devonshire and the Cardinal de Rohan, is something which would have been surprising in the 17th century and, and unknown in the 19th. This is the century, therefore, when these things begin to spread. There were, of course, more respectable, interesting manifestations of the same anti-rationalism. For example, Lafater in Zurich, a kind of Jung of his day, invented the science of what he called physiognomonia. He attempted to measure people's faces for the purpose of obtaining some kind of insight into their psychological character because of a belief in the unity and indissolubility of the spiritual and the physical aspects of men. At the same time, he didn't discourage all those much more dubious phrenologists and spiritualists of one kind or another, all those strange messiahs who wandered about, occasionally committing crimes, at other times merely causing stupefaction, some of whom were arrested for their crimes, other of whom were allowed to wander about at large in the wilder and more old-fashioned portions, for example, of the German empires. At any rate, this is the atmosphere in which we move. So that under the surface of this apparently coherent and apparently elegant century, there are all kinds of dark forces moving. And Haman, of whom I spoke, is merely the most poetical, theologically the profoundest, and in a sense the most interesting representative of this violent revolt of what might be called quality against quantity, of the whole anti-scientific yearnings and desires of men. Harman's fundamental doctrine, which I tried to expound perhaps over hastily last time, was this, that God was not a geometer, he was not a mathematician, that he was a poet, that there was something blasphemous in attempting to foist upon God our own puny human logical schemes, that when Kant said to him, Harman, being a friend of his, that he thought that the science of astronomy had finally come to an end, that the astronomers knew all they could know, and it was a satisfactory thing that this particular science could now be locked up as having been, so to speak, completed. When Kant said that, said Harman, I felt like strangling him, as if there would be no more miracles in the universe, as if any human endeavor could be regarded as over and done with, finished. 
the very notion that human beings were finite, that there were certain subjects about which everything could be known, that there was some portion of nature which could be fully investigated and some questions which could be ultimately answered to, all this appeared to him to be shocking, unreal and plainly stupid. This, I think, it really is the heart of Harman's doctrine. It is a kind of mystical vitalism which perceives in nature and in history the voice of God. That the voice of God speaks to us through nature was an old mystical belief. Harman added to this the further doctrine that history too speaks to us, that all the various historical events which are simply taken to be ordinary empirical events by unenlightened historians are really methods whereby the divine speaks to us. Each of these events possesses an occult or mystical significance which those with eyes to see can perceive. He was among the earliest of those, and when I say earliest of those, I mean that he was later than Vico, but then Vico wasn't read that he was among the earliest of those who said that myths, myths and symbols, myths were not simply false statements about the world, not either the wicked inventions of unscrupulous persons seeking to throw dust in people's eyes, nor pretty embellishments invented by poets for the purpose of, in some way, decorating their wares. Myths were ways in which human beings expressed their sense of the ineffable and inexpressible mysteries of nature. And there was no other way in which they could be expressed. If words were used, they didn't do their job properly. Words cut things to pieces too much. Words classified. Words were too rational. The attempt to tie things up into neat parcels and arrange them in some beautifully analytic fashion destroyed the unity, the continuity, and the vitality of the subject matter, that is to say life and the world which we were contemplating. Myths in some way conveyed this mystery in artistic images and artistic symbols which without words managed to connect man with the mysteries of nature. This was roughly speaking the doctrine. Now the whole thing was of course an immense protest against the French. It spread not only to Germany, it, it was phenomena of this kind are noticeable in England also, where perhaps the most eloquent exponent of this point of view, who comes somewhat later in time than Harman, is of course the mystical poet William Blake. Blake's enemies, the persons whom Blake regards as the villains of the whole modern period, are Locke and Newton. Them he regards as those devils who killed the spirit by cutting reality into some kind of mathematically symmetrical pieces, whereas reality is a living whole which can only be appreciated in some non-mathematical fashion. Let me give you typical quotations from Blake in that sense which will convey this too. He was a typical Swedenborgian, and the Swedenborg's disciples were very typical of the kind of occult subterranean movements in the 18th century which I referred to. What Blake, like all mystics of his type, desired was some kind of recovery of control over so to speak, the spiritual element, which in some way had become petrified as a result of human degeneration and the wicked work of unimaginative killers of the human spirit like mathematicians and scientists. He says, laws are, are needed to fence men off. And our children wept and built tombs in desolate places and formed laws of prudence and, and called them the eternal laws of God. This is directed against what might be called rationalists of the 18th century, and the whole notion of um, symmetrically arranged order founded upon non-mystical, empirical, or logical reasoning. When he writes in those famous lines that everyone knows, Robin Redbreast, in a cage, puts all heaven in a rage, the cage of which he speaks is the Enlightenment. And that is the cage in which he and persons like him appear to suffocate all their lives in the second half of the 18th century. Children of a future age, reading this indignant page, know that in a former time, love, sweet love, was thought a crime. Love to him was identical with art. Jesus, he calls an artist. His disciples, he also calls artists. Art is the tree of life. Science is the tree of death. Liberate the spark. That is the great cry of all persons who feel somehow strangled and suffocated by the new tidy scientific order which doesn't respond to the deeper problems which agitate the human soul. The Germans tended on the whole to suppose that in France nobody was aware 
Nobody began to be aware of what these deeper problems were, that all the French were somehow desiccated monkeys with no conception of what it was that moved human beings, human beings as possessors of souls, as possessors of some kind of spiritual needs. This was not entirely true. If, for example, you go to such a representative thinker of the Enlightenment as even Diderot, upon whom I suppose the Germans looked as one of the, the Germans of whom I speak, looked as one of the most noxious representatives of the new materialism, the new science, the new uh, destruction of all that was spiritual and religious in life. If you go to someone like that, in him you will find something which is not all that unlike the particular attitude, even among the Germans, which I have described. Diderot is perfectly aware that there is such a thing as the irrational element in man, and that there are unconscious depths in which all kinds of dark forces move. And he is aware that human genius feeds upon these, and that the forces of light are not by themselves enough to create those divine works of art which he himself admires. He speaks of art very often in terms of great passion and says that there is about the great genius, there is about the great artist, something, je ne sais quoi, which is a 17th century expression, which enables him to imagine these works of art with a degree of sweep, with a magnificence of depth of insight, and with a degree of intellectual courage, the taking on of huge intellectual risks, which makes men of genius and artists of this type akin to great criminals. And there is, a, there is a passage in Diderot where he speculates upon the nearness to criminals of artists, because they both defy rules. They are both persons who are in some way in love with power, magnificence, and splendor, and kick over the traces of normal life, normal existence, and the whole tame existence of over-civilized man. Diderot is among the first to preach that there are two men. There is the artificial man, who belongs in society and conforms to the practices of society, and seeks to please, and is artificial, the sort of normal, artificial, mincing uh, little figure of the caricaturists of the 18th century. Within this man, however, there is imprisoned a violent, bold, dark, criminal instinct of a man who wishes to break out. And this is the man who, if properly controlled, is perhaps responsible for the magnificent works of genius which are created. Genius of this type can't be tamed. Genius of this type has nothing to do with those rules which the uh, Abbe Butter or the Abbe Dubas laid down as being the rational conventions, the rational rules in accordance with which alone good works of art could be produced. Let me read you a typical passage. Beware, says Diderot, this is, comes from the Salon of 1765, that is to say one of those early art criticisms uh, for which Diderot is justly famous. Beware of those whose pockets are full of esprit, of wit, and who scatter this wit at every opportunity everywhere. They have no demon within them. They are not gloomy or somber or melancholy or silent. They are never either awkward or foolish. The lark, the chaffinch, the linnet, the canary, they chirp and twitter all the live long day. At sunset, they fold their head under their wing and lo, they're asleep. It is then that genius takes his lamp and lights it. And this dark, solitary, savage bird this untamable creature, with its gloomy, melancholy plumage, opens its throat and begins its song, makes the groves resound, and breaks the silence and the darkness of the night. This is an appeal to genius, as in contrast with talent, in contrast with rules, in contrast with the so-called vaunted virtues of the 18th century, sanity, rationality, measure, proportion, and all the rest of it, which shows that even in this terrible, desiccated city of Paris, where, according to the Germans, nobody has ever lived, nobody has ever seen a colour, nobody has ever known what a stirring of the human soul is, nobody has any notion of what the agonies of the spirit are, what God is, or what tra transfiguration of man may be. In this very town, there were persons who were aware of what might be called self-transcendence, of irrational forces, of something which undoubtedly was somewhat of the same type as that which Haman sang, sang forth. But, of course, and at this point, somebody will again say, what about Rousseau? Well, what indeed about Rousseau? It would be foolish to deny that Rousseau was one of the great factors, the Rousseau's doctrines, at least. Rousseau's words were among the factors which influenced the Romantic movement. Nevertheless, again, I have to repeat, his role has been exaggerated. If you consider what it is that Rousseau actually said, as opposed to the manner in which he said it, and I think the manner and the life is what are important, 
If you ask yourself what Rousseau said, what he said is the purest milk of the rationalist word. All that Rousseau said is we live in a corrupt society. We live in a bad, hypocritical society where men lie to each other and murder each other and are false before each other. That it is possible to discover the truth. That this truth is to be discovered not by means of sophistication or Cartesian logic, but by looking within the heart of the simple, uncorrupt human being, the noble savage or the child or whoever it may be. That once this truth is discovered, it is an eternal truth, true for all men, everywhere, in all climes and seasons. And when we have discovered this truth, then it is important that we should live in accordance with it. This is not different from what the Hebrew prophets have said, or every Christian preacher who has ever preached against the corrupt sophistication of the big cities and the falling away from God which goes on in such places. Rousseau's actual doctrine is not very different from that of the encyclopedists. He disliked them personally because temperamentally he was a kind of dervish from the desert, he was paranoid, savage and gloomy in some respects, and highly neurotic, as we should today say, and therefore had not much in common with the people at Holbach's rather irreverent table or at the uh, elegant receptions which Voltaire held at Ferney. But this was, to a certain degree, a personal or emotional matter. The actual substance of what Rousseau said was not so very different from the official enlightened doctrine of the 18th century. What was different was the manner, and what was different was the temperament. When Rousseau begins describing his own particular states of mind and states of soul, when he begins describing the emotions which tear him apart, the violent paroxysms of rage or joy through which he goes, then, of course, he does use a tone which is very different from that of the 18th century. But this is not the doctrine of Rousseau which was inherited by the Jacobins, or which in various forms entered into the doctrines of the 19th century. Let me read you the kind of passage of Rousseau which does entitle him to be regarded as one of the fathers of Romanticism. I didn't reason, I didn't philosophize. Ravished, I surrendered to the confusion of these great ideas. I suffocated in the universe. I wanted to leap into the infinite. My spirit gave itself to swelling ecstasy. That, of course, is a passage which is not very similar to the soberer or saner passages of the encyclopedists. That wouldn't have been cared for by Helvetius or by Holbach or by Voltaire or even Diderot. Rousseau's point was that nobody could love as Rousseau loved. Nobody could hate as Rousseau hated. Nobody could suffer as Rousseau suffered, and only Rousseau could understand Rousseau. He was unique. Nobody else could understand him, and only a genius could understand another genius. This was, in a, in a certain sense, a doctrine opposed to the view that the truth was equally open to all reasonable men who did not becloud their understandings with unnecessary emotions uh, and with unnecessary ignorance. What Rousseau does is to contrast with the so-called cold logic which he constantly complains about, cold reason. He contrasts with that the hot tears of shame or joy or misery or love or despair or mortification or spiritual agony or ecstatic vision. And that is why Harman called him the best of the sophists. But still a sophist. Still a sophist. Harman was Socrates and Rousseau was a sophist. He was the best because he gave signs of understanding that it wasn't quite right with this uh, elegant and rational and sane Paris. But still he was a sophist because his doctrines still appeal to reason. They still appeal to the fact that there was some kind of establishment, some kind of uh, good kind of human life with good kind of men, if only they would scrape off all the falsehood which had managed to accumulate upon them through the centuries, if only they could remove the bad society which had corrupted them, if only they could manage to do that, then they could live well forever in accordance with timeless precepts. That is precisely what the Germans disbelieved, and precisely what they rightly accused Rousseau in believing. The only difference was that the other encyclopedists in Paris believed this could be done by reform. They believed this could be done by gradually. They believed this might be done by somehow converting, converting the rulers to their point of view, getting hold of an enlightened despot, and if he was enlightened enough, he could establish some kind of better life on earth. Rousseau believed that the whole cursed superstructure must be raised to the ground. The entire wicked human society must be burnt to ashes, and then a new phoenix would arise, constructed by him and by his disciples. But in principle, what they wished to do was the same, although perhaps their view of the methods may have differed. Now, if you compare this, this kind of talk, with what the Germans were saying at the same time, you will see that the German attitude towards all this is far more violent. Let me read you a typical passage from the poet Lenz, who did, in fact, commit suicide, who was a contemporary of Rousseau, roughly speaking, and says the following. 
action. Action is the soul of the world. Not pleasure, not abandonment to feeling, not abandonment to reasoning, only action. Only by action does one become the image of God. The God who creates ceaselessly and ceaselessly rejoices in his works. Without action, all pleasure, all feeling, all knowledge is nothing but a postponed death. We must not cease from toil until we have created free space, even if this space is a fearful waste and a fearful void. And then we shall brood over it as God brooded over the waste and the void before the world was created. And then something will arise. Oh, bliss. Oh, godlike feeling. This is something of very different order from even the most violent vibrations, from the most ecstatic exclamations of Rousseau and indicates a very different attitude, this sudden passion for action as such, and hatred of any established order, hatred of any kind of view of the universe as having a structure which calm or even uncalm perception is able to um, understand, contemplate, classify, describe, and finally use. This, I think, is unique to the Germans. Again, if you ask for the causes of this, I don't wish to go back to what I was saying last time, namely that it was largely due, I think, to, as it were, both the intense spirituality of pietism from amongst whom these people spring, on the one hand, and on the other hand to the ravages of science, which had undermined their pietistic faith, and while leaving them with the temperament of pietists, had removed the religious certainties of that movement. But if you look at the plays, and the, the fourth and fifth and sixth rate plays, which the so-called storm and stress movement in Germany produced in the 60s and 70s, you will there find a very different tone from that prevailing anywhere else in European literature. If you look, for example, at Klinger's play, Klinger was a, was a German playwright uh, who wrote a play called Storm, Sturm und Drang, Storm and Stress, after whom the movement is called. There's a play by Klinger called The Twins, in which one of the twins, a more powerful, imaginative, and fiery romantic, kills his weak, priggish and disagreeable brother. Uh, because he says, because his brother won't let him develop his nature in accordance with his demonic or titanic demands. Now, in all previous tragedies, the assumption was that in some other society, there would be no need for these dreadful things to occur. Society is bad, therefore it must be improved. Men are done down by society. Well then, one must be able to imagine a better society, as Rousseau was able to imagine it, in which people do not suffocate, in which people do not fight in which the bad are not at the top and the good at the bottom, in which parents do not torture their children, in which women are not married off to men they do not love. It must be possible to construct a better world. Not so in Klinger's tragedy. Not so in Julius von Tarent, a tragedy by Leisewitz. I don't wish to recite before you these justly forgotten names. But <laughs> broadly speaking, the substance of all these plays is that there is some kind of insoluble conflict in the world, in nature itself, by which the strong cannot live with the weak, the lions cannot live with the lambs. The strong must have room in which to breathe, and the weak go to the wall if they do it, and the weak will suffer and will naturally resist, and it is right that the weak should resist, and it is right that the strong should suppress them. And therefore, conflict, collision, tragedy, death, all kinds of horrors which go on, are in some way inevitably involved in the nature of the universe, and the view is therefore fatalistic and pessimistic, not scientific and optimistic, not even spiritual and optimistic in any sense of the word. This has a kind of natural affinity to Harman's view that God is closer to the abnormal than he is to the normal, which in fact he openly says. The normal don't really understand what goes on. You see, it's a sort of original, perhaps, moment at which the whole, what might be called Dostoevsky complex, comes into existence. In which God is, it's in a certain sense, of course, the application of Christianity, but a rather new one, because so sincere and so deeply um, intended. In which God is closer to the thieves and the prostitutes, the sinners and the publicans, than he is, Harman says, to the smooth philosophers of Paris, or the smooth clergymen in Berlin who are trying to reconcile um, religion with reason, which is degradation and humiliation of everything that man cares for. All the great masters who excelled in human endeavors, says Harman, were sick men in one way or another, had wounds. Hercules, Ajax, Socrates, St. Paul, Solon, the Hebrew prophets, Bacchantes, demonic figures, none of these were men of good sense. And that, I think, it lies at the heart, so to speak, of the whole of this violent doctrine of personal self-assertion, which is really the heart of the German storm and stress. However, 
All these persons are comparatively minor figures. I merely wish to bring them out in order to show you that Haman, who I think justly do does deserve to be rescued from the darkness of oblivion, wasn't entirely alone. The only worthwhile, the only valuable work which Sturm and Drang produced, I suppose, was Werther by Goethe, which was a typical expression of it also. There too, there is no cure. There is no situation in which Werther can avoid suicide. There is no situation in which Werther being in love with the married lady and the marriage vow being what it is and believed by Werther and by the lady herself to be what it is. There is no way in which this problem can be solved. If one man's love and another man's love come into collision, it is a hopeless and helpless business and must end badly. That is the moral of Werther and that is why young men up and down Germany were said to have committed suicide in its name. Not because in the 18th century or in that particular society there was no adequate solution, as because they despaired of the world and thought it an irrational place in which a solution was in principle undiscoverable. This then is the atmosphere, so to speak, which developed in Germany in the 1760s and 1770s. But there were two men who were, I think, the true fathers of Romanticism, who were certainly of vaster size than any of the people I have mentioned hitherto as being responsible for it, and about whom I must next speak. They both emerged from this movement, one in some sense sympathetic to it, the other acutely hostile to it, but by his work a greater advancer of its ideals, as ironically sometimes happens. The first is Herder, the second is Kant, and on them I must stop a little. I don't wish to expound to you the general ideas and the uh, new notions for which Herder is responsible and by which he transformed, for example, our notions of history, our notions of society, the vast influence which this extraordinary thinker had. He was also, of course, a pietist and a Prussian, and, like the others, revolted against the spick and span empire of Frederick the Great. It was really this tidy, enlightened despotism, and it was enlightened, managed by French intellectuals and French officials under the leadership of this extremely clear-headed and extremely energetic and extremely powerful despot that really caused these good men to suffocate. Even Kant, let alone Herder, who was by nature of a somewhat irascible and somewhat unbalanced temperament. The doctrines of Herder about which I wish to speak are these. There are three doctrines in particular which contributed to the Romantic movement very powerfully and which arose quite naturally out of the milieu of which I've spoken. One is the notion of what I should like to call expressionism. The other is the notion of belonging, what it means to belong to a group. And the third is the notion that ideals, true ideals, are often incompatible with one another and cannot be reconciled. These three ideas each had a revolutionary significance in their day, and they are worth lingering over a little because they are commonly not done justice to, even in primers of the history of thought. The first notion of expressivism is this. Herder believed that one of the fundamental functions of human beings was to express, to speak. And therefore, that whatever a man did expressed his full nature. And if he didn't express his full nature, it's because he maimed himself or restrained himself or in some way laid some kind of leash upon his energies. And this he learned, of course, from his master, Haman. He really was a direct and faithful disciple of this strange figure, Haman, who was called the Magus in Norden, the Magus in the north. Magus meaning one of the three magi, in that sense of Magus. Now, normally speaking, if we take, for example, the aesthetics of the 18th century, even the, the, the so to speak, much more passionate aesthetics of someone like Diderot than the dry and conventional aesthetics of the Abbe Bateux, if we take the aesthetics of the 18th century, broadly speaking, the value of a work of art would be said to consist in its being what it was, namely, the value of a picture was that it was beautiful. What made it beautiful, one could argue about. Whether it was because it gave pleasure, whether it was because it satisfied the intellect, whether it was because it had some peculiar relation to the harmonies of the, of the spheres or of the universe and was in some way um, a copy of some great platonic original to which the artist in a moment of inspiration had access, about that you might disagree. What everyone agreed about was that the value of a work of art consisted in the properties which it had, being what it is, beautiful, symmetrical, shapely, whatever it might be. A, a, a silver bowl was beautiful because it was a beautiful bowl, because it had the properties of being beautiful, however that was defined. This had nothing to do with who made it, and it had nothing to do with why it was made. The artist took very much the position of a purveyor who said, 
My private life is no business of the man who buys the work of art. You have asked for a silver bowl, here it is, I provide it. It is no business of yours whether I am a good husband, or a good voter, or a nice man, or believe in God. You have asked for a table, here is a table. If it is a solid, sound table, such as you need, what complaints can you have? You have asked for a painting, you have asked for a portrait, if it is a good portrait, take it. I am Mozart, I am Haydn, I hope to produce a beautiful musical composition, by which I mean one which will be recognized as beautiful by others, and for which I shall be paid an adequate commission, and which will perhaps make my name as an immortal artist. That is the normal 18th century view, and it is the view of a great many people, indeed probably the majority, since. This was not the view which the Germans of whom I speak took, particularly not Hamann and certainly not Herder. A work of art is the expression of somebody. It's always a voice speaking. A work of art is the voice of one man addressing himself to other men. And whether it be a silver bowl or a musical composition or a poem or even a code of laws, whatever it might be, any artifact of human hands is in some way the expression of the attitude to life, conscious or unconscious, of its maker. When we appreciate a work of art, we are put in some kind of contact with the man who made it, and in some sense, it speaks to us. That is certainly the doctrine. That is why the idea that an artist should say, as an artist, I do this, and as a voter or a husband, I do that, the very notion that a man can in some way chop himself up into compartments and say that with one hand I do one thing, and this has nothing to do with what my other hand is doing, that my private convictions have nothing to do with the speeches which I put into the mouths of the characters in my tragedy, that I am simply a purveyor, that what must be judged is the work of art and not the maker, that the biography, the psychology, the purposes, the whole substance, so to speak, of the artist is irrelevant to the work of art. That doctrine was rejected with violence by Herder and by those who followed him, who said, if a, take for example folk song, if a folk song speaks to you, it is because the people who have made it were Germans like yourself and they spoke to you who belong with them in the same society and because they were Germans they used particular nuances, they used particular successions of sounds, they used particular words which being in some way connected, which swimming in the great tide of words and symbols and experience upon which all Germans swim has something peculiar to say to certain persons which it cannot say to certain other persons. The Portuguese cannot understand the inwardness of a German song as a German can, and a German cannot understand the inwardness of a Portuguese song. And the very fact that there is such thing as inwardness at all in these songs is an argument for supposing that these are not simply objects, like objects in nature, which don't speak. They are, were, they are in some sense, artifacts, that is to say, something which a man has made for the purpose of com communicating with another man. This is the doctrine of art as expression, or the doctrine of art as communication. And then, of course, Herder goes on from this to develop the thesis in the most poetical and imaginative manner. And he says, some things are made by individuals and other things are made by groups. Some things are made consciously and other things are made unconsciously. If you ask who has made folk song, who has made folk dancing, who has made the German laws, who has made the German morals, who has made the institutions under which we live, you cannot give the answer, this lies shrouded in the mists of impersonal antiquity. Nevertheless, men have made it. The world is what men have made of it. Our world, our German world, is constructed by other Germans, and that is why it smells and feels and looks and sounds to us as it does. And from this he developed the notion that every man seeks to belong to some kind of group, or in fact does belong to it, and if taken out of it, will feel alien and not at home. The whole notion of being at home or being cut off from one's natural roots, the whole idea of roots, the whole idea of belonging to a group, a sect, a movement, was invented largely by Herder. There are anticipations of this in the marvelous work of Vico, but I have to say again, the works of Vico have been forgotten, and although Herder might have seen it in the late 70s, he developed most of his ideas before any date at which apparently he had seen the work of his great Italian predecessor. Herder's fundamental conviction was something of this order, that every man who wishes to express himself uses words. Words are not his invention. They are, so to speak, already inherited by him in some kind of inherited stream of traditional images. This stream itself has been fed by other men expressing themselves. A man who has, been, has more in common, of an impalpable kind, with other men with whom nature has placed him in some proximity than he has with men remote from him. 
Herder doesn't use the criteria of blood, and he doesn't use the criteria of race. He talks about nation, but nation in the 18th century didn't have the connotation of nation in the 19th. He speaks of language as a bond, and he speaks of soil as a bond. And the thesis, roughly speaking, is that that which people who belong to the same group have in common is more directly responsible for their being as they are than that which they have in common with others in other places. To wit, the way in which, let us say, a German rises and sits down, the way in which he dances, the way in which he legislates, his handwriting and his poetry and his music and the way in which he combs his hair and the way in which he philosophizes, all have some impalpable common gestalt all have some pattern quality, in virtue of which they are recognizably German, both by him and by others, wherein they differ from similar acts on the part of the Chinese. The Chinese also comb their hair. They also write poetry. They also have laws. They also hunt and obtain their food in various ways and make their clothing. And there is something common, of course, to the way in which all men react to similar natural stimuli. Nevertheless, there is a peculiar gestalt quality which qualifies certain human groups, not nationalities perhaps. Perhaps these groups are smaller. Herder was certainly not a nationalist in the sense of believing, so to speak, there was some kind of deep, impalpable essence to do certainly with uh, blood or race. All he believed was that human groups grew in some plant-like or some animal-like fashion and that organic, botanical, and other biological metaphors were more suitable for describing such growth than were the chemical and mathematical metaphors of the French um, 18th century popularizers of science. Now, from this, certain romantic conclusions certainly do follow. That's the conclusions which affected anti-rationalism, as at least it was understood in the 18th century. And that is this, that if indeed this is so, then it clearly follows that objects can't be described without reference to the purposes of their makers. The value of a work of art has to be somehow analyzed in terms of the particular group of persons to whom it is addressed, the motive of him who speaks, the effect upon those who are spoken to, and the bond which it automatically creates between the speaker and the spoken to. It is a form of communication. And if it is a form of communication, then it hasn't got what might be called an impersonal or eternal uh, value. If you wish to understand a work of art, uh, for example, made by some ancient Greek, it is certainly no use laying down timeless criteria in terms of which all works of art must be beautiful, and then considering whether the Greek work of art is beautiful or not in terms of these criteria. Unless you understand what the Greeks were, what they wanted, how they lived, unless, as Herder says, echoing Vico in the most uncanny way, as Herder says, by an act of the most enormous difficulty, with the greatest possible effort of the imagination, unless you enter into the feelings of these remote, exceedingly strange peoples who are remote from you in time and place, unless you try by some act of imagination to reconstruct within yourself the form of life which these people led, what they wanted, how they lived, what their laws were, what their ethical principles were, what their streets looked like, what their various values were, unless you try, in other words, to live yourself into that form of life, all this is commonplace now, but was not commonplace in the 70s, 60s and 70s, when it was first spoken. Unless you try and do that, your chances of truly understanding their art and truly understanding their writings and really knowing what Plato meant and really know who Socrates was, are small. Socrates, for him, is not uh, the timeless sage of the French Enlightenment, timeless rationalist sage, nor is he simply the ironical deflator of pompous know-alls, which is what Harman conceived him to be. Socrates is a 5th century Athenian who lived in 5th century Athens, not in the 4th century, not in the 2nd, not in Germany, not in France, but in Greece, then and only then. And in order to understand Greek philosophy, you must understand Greek art. In order to understand Greek art, you must understand Greek history. In order to understand Greek history, you must understand Greek geography. You must see the plants which they saw. You must understand the soil on which they lived, and so on and so on. And this, therefore, becomes the beginning of the whole notion of historicism, evolutionism, the very notion that you can only understand other human beings in terms of an environment very dissimilar to your own. And this is also at the root of, and this is what the notion of belonging is. The notion of what it is to belong to somebody was really elucidated for the first time by Herder. And that is why the whole notion of cosmopolitan man 
a man who's equally at home in Paris or Copenhagen or Iceland or India is to him repellent. A man belongs to where he is. People have roots. They can only create in terms of those symbols in which they were brought up. And they were brought up in terms of some kind of closed society which spoke to them in a uniquely intelligible fashion. Any man who hasn't had the good fortune to suffer this, any man who was brought up without roots on a desert island by himself, an exile, an emigre, is to that extent weakened and his creative powers are automatically made the smaller. This was not a doctrine which could have been understood, which certainly which could not have been approved of by the rationalist, universalist, objectivist, cosmopolitan thinkers of the French 18th century. That was the first point. But a far more startling conclusion uh, really follows from this, which Herder didn't perhaps himself altogether stress. And that was this. If the value of every culture resides in what that particular culture seeks after, as he says, every culture has its own center of gravity, and you must determine what this center of gravity, the Schwerpunkt, as he calls it, what the center of gravity is before you can even understand what these men were about. Certainly, it's no use judging these things from the point of view of some other century or some other culture. If you have to do that, then you will grasp the fact that different ages had different ideals, and these ideals were each in its way valid for those times and those places, and can be admired and can be appreciated by us now. But now, I, in my very first lecture, I try to lay down the proposition that one of the great axioms of the 18th century Enlightenment, which is what Romanticism came to destroy, was that there could be valid objective answers could be discovered to all the great questions which agitate mankind. How to live, what to be, what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong, what is beautiful, what is ugly, why act thus rather than thus. And that these answers can be obtained by some special method recommended by the particular thinker in question. And that all these answers can be stated in the form of propositions. And all these propositions, if they are true, will be compatible with one another. Perhaps even more than compatible. Perhaps they will even entail one another. And taken together, these propositions will, as it were, constitute that ideal state of affairs, that perfect state of affairs, which, for one reason or another, we all would like to see happen, whether or not it is actually practicable or feasible. Now, if Herder is right, if 5th century Greeks could only go for an ideal quite different from that of the Babylonians. If the Egyptian view of life, because these people lived in Egypt, which had a different geography and a different climate and different factors, and because the Egyptians were descended from people with a completely different ideology from the Greeks, if what the Egyptians wanted was different from what the Greeks wanted, but equally valid, equally fruitful, if all these things are true, and Herder is one of those not very many thinkers in the world who really do absolutely adore things for being what they are and don't condemn them for not being something else. They, for Herder, everything is delightful. He's delighted by Babylon and he's delighted by Assyria. He's delighted by India and he's delighted by Egypt. He thinks well of the Greeks, he thinks well of the Middle Ages, he thinks well of the 18th century, he thinks well of almost everything except the immediate environment of his own time and place. But if there is anything in Herder which he dislikes, it is the elimination of one culture by another. He doesn't like Julius Caesar, because Julius Caesar trampled on a lot of Asiatic cultures, and we shall now not know what the Cappadocians were really after. He doesn't like the Crusades, because the Crusades damaged the Byzantines, or they damaged the Arabs, and these cultures had every right to the richest and fullest self-expression without the trampling feet of a lot of imperialist knights. He dislikes every form of violence, coercion, and the swallowing of one culture by another because he wants everything to be as much of what it is as it can possibly be. Herder is really the originator and the author, if you like, not of nationalism, as is sometimes said, although no doubt some of his ideas entered nationalism, but much more, I don't quite know what give, name to give it to, something like populism. That is to say, if you like, in its more comical forms, he's really the originator of all those antiquarians who want natives to remain as native as possible, who like arts and crafts, who detest standardization, everyone who likes the quaint, people who wish to preserve the most exquisite forms of old provincialism without impingement upon it of some hideous metropolitan uniformity. Herder is really the father and the ancestor of all those travelers, all those amateurs who go around the world ferreting out all kinds of forgotten forms of life, delighted in everything that is peculiar, everything that is odd, everything that is native, everything that is untouched. 
In that sense, of course, he did feed the streams of human sentimentality to a very high degree. But that is anyhow he has temperament. And that is why, since he wants everything to be as much of what it can be as it can be, that is to develop itself to its richest and fullest extent, the notion that there can be one single ideal for all men everywhere becomes unintelligible. If the Greeks had an ideal which was perfect for them as Greeks, and if the Romans had an ideal which was less perfect, but as much as could be done for people who were unfortunately Romans, who were obviously less gifted than the Greeks, at least from Herder's point of view. If the Middle Ages produced magnificent works, early Middle Ages, in the form, say, of the Song of the Nibelungs, which he much admired, or the other early epics, which he regarded as the simple heroic expressions of uncontaminated fresh peoples still wandering in the woods, uncrushed by some fearful, jealous neighbors who trample upon their culture in a brutal way. If all this is true, we can't have all these things together. What is the ideal form of life? We can't be both Greek and Phoenician and medieval and Eastern and Western and Northern and Southern. We can't attain to the highest ideals of all the centuries and all the places at once. Since we can't do that, the whole notion of the perfect life, the whole notion of there being a human ideal, which it is the business of all men to strive after, that there is some kind of answer to these questions, even as there is an answer in chemistry, or as there is an answer in physics, or as there is an answer in mathematics to certain questions to which, in principle at least, some kind of final answer can be given, or if not a final answer, at any rate an answer which approximates to finality, which is more final than any we have obtained yet, with a hope, or at least a direction, that the further we proceed in the same direction, the nearer to the final solution we come. If this is true of physics, and of chemistry, and of mathematics, and, as the 18th century thought, should be true of ethics, of politics, of aesthetics. If it is possible to lay down criteria which tell you what makes a perfect work of art, what makes a perfect life, what makes a perfect character, what makes a perfect political constitution, if it is possible to give these answers, this, this answer can only be obtained by, so to speak, supposing that all other answers, however interesting, however fascinating, are false. But if Herder is right, and it was right for the Greeks to proceed in the Greek direction, and it was right for the Indians to proceed in the Indian direction, and the Greek ideal and the Indian ideal are totally incompatible, which he not merely confessed, but emphasized with a kind of joy. If variety and difference are not merely a fact about the world, but a splendid fact, which is what he thought it to be, and argues for the uh, variety of the imagination of the creator and the splendor of human creative powers and the infinite possibilities still before mankind and the unfulfillability of human ambitions and the general excitement of living in a world in which nothing can ever be fully exhausted. If that is the image, then the notion of final answer to the question how to live becomes absolutely meaningless. It can mean nothing at all because all these answers are presumably incompatible with one another. Hence, Herder's final, so to speak, conclusion Namely, that each group, each human group, must strive after that which somehow lies in its bones, which is part of its tradition. Each, each man belongs to the group he belongs to. His business as a human being is to speak, speak the truth as it appears to him. The truth as it appears to him is as valid as the truth as it appears to others. From this vast variety of colors, a, a wonderful mosaic can be made, but nobody can see the whole mosaic. Nobody can see all the trees. Only God can see the entire universe. Men, because they belong where they belong and are where they are and live where they do, cannot. But each age has its own internal ideal. And therefore, any form of nostalgic seeking after the past, for example, why cannot we be we like the Greeks? Why cannot we be like the Romans? Which is presumably what French political philosophers or French painters or French sculptors were saying to themselves in the 18th century. The whole notion of revival, the whole notion of going back to the Middle Ages, back to Roman virtues, back to Sparta, back to Athens, or alternatively, any form of cosmopolitanism. Why cannot we create a world state of such a kind that everybody in it will fit smoothly like ideal bricks, who will form a structure which will go on forever and ever because it is constructed upon an indestructible formula, which is the truth obtained by uh, infallible methods. All this must become nonsense, meaningless, self-contradictory. And by uttering this, by issuing this particular, allowing this particular uh, doctrine to emerge, Herda did plunge a most terrible dagger into the body of European rationalism, from which it never recovered. And in this sense, he is certainly one of the fathers of the Romantic movement to which I have not yet come. 
That is to say, he is one of the fathers of the movement, one of the attributes, the characteristics of which certainly is the denial of unity, the denial of harmony, the denial of the compatibility of ideals, whether in the sphere of action or in the sphere of thought. And Lenz's apostrophe, which I read to you, about action, action, always action, make room for action. We can only live in action, otherwise nothing is worth having. That is very sympathetic to Herder's whole point of view, because for him, life consists in expressing experience as it comes, communicating it to others with the whole of your undivided personality. As for what men will make of it in 200 years' time, 500 years' time, 2,000 years' time, it doesn't matter, he doesn't care, he doesn't see why he should care. And this, I think, is a very new and extremely revolutionary and very upsetting note in what had, for the last 2,000 years, been the solid uh, philosophia perennis of the West, according to which all questions have true answers. All true answers are, in principle, discoverable, and all the answers are, in principle, compatible or combinable into one harmonious whole, like a jigsaw puzzle. If what Herder said was true, this is false. And upon this people then proceeded to argue and to struggle, both in practice and in theory, both in the course of national revolutionary wars and in the course of violent conflict of doctrines and of practice, both in the arts and in thought, for the next 170 years. Next time, I propose to talk to you about Kant, about whom I fear I didn't have time to talk today, and Schiller, and by this time, really, to enter into the heart of Romanticism proper. Thank you very much.